Okay, we are broadcasting. All right. And we're going to get feedback in 10 seconds because... Here we go. Okay, I got it. Cool. And we also learned something interesting that the stream is approximately five to eight seconds behind live. Oh. That was something that we learned too. So like when we ask for questions, yeah, it's almost like you have to wait 10 seconds. That's weird. Responses, so. hmm. um, okay, so let me go ahead and lock this on. All right. And I see people coming in. All Thank right. everyone for joining. Um, we got started just a little bit late. We're going to go ahead and give it maybe three more minutes, and we'll go ahead and get started. And that gives you a couple minutes, Mark, to, uh, to get prepared. I can't even say Mark S. because you're both Mark S. It's yeah. true, yeah. So <laughs> I won't talk. I'll just, uh, I'm going to mute myself here. Okay. I see that there's still uh, a few folks that are coming in, so we'll go ahead and give it about two more minutes, and then we'll go ahead and get started. So thanks, everyone, for uh, your patience, especially as we're still working through some of the technological glitches. Um, for those of you who are coming in on view and want to participate but could not, I put a link into the chat on the YouTube page. Uh, where you can go ahead and join the uh, participate side and, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a couple minutes so um, hang on for two more minutes and we'll go ahead and get started Hey, James, how's it going? Hello, very good, thanks. At the stream is approximately five. Uh, you're a couple minutes behind there. <laughs> oh, that was something that we learned too. So like when we ask for questions, yeah, it's almost like you have to wait. So I muted you, James, just because we were getting some feedback um, with the delay, so. Which is normal. I, I, I mute folks uh, until they're ready to speak. So why don't we go ahead and get started here. I see that there's a bunch of people online. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, it looks like we have a good audience for tonight, so thanks, everyone, for taking the time. A um, little housekeeping, as we normally do. For those of you who are on the participate link, of course, you can always unmute yourself and ask your questions, or we do have the group chat over on the right-hand side of your screen. For those of you who are on the view side, we do have the new chat feature right on the YouTube window, so you can go ahead and enter your questions there. I'll be monitoring that throughout, and whenever there's a question that pops up, Mark, I'll go ahead and interrupt you. Sure. And ask the question. 
So again, tonight we're doing airport operations. Uh, Mark is joining us, and he's going to lead the session. And this is his, I believe, your second time, Mark, uh, yeah. leading a session. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for returning. Sure. Uh, I know the last one was a good session. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. All right. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark. Um, very quick background about me, not to bore anybody. I'm a uh, private pilot. I've got my instrument rating. I'm uh, working on my commercial and multi, uh, and eventually we'll end up with a, a CFI, double I, etc. when I uh, have more time and money and things like that. Um, I also spent about 10 years uh, as an engineer building aircraft, so I did that for a while. Um, so... Uh, yeah, so let's get started. Um, so first things first, uh, tonight we're going to be talking about uh, airport operations, obviously, um, and uh, going to start with sources for airport information, so where you get all the information that you need um, when you're going to be at an airport. Uh, talk about types of airports, movement area versus non-movement areas, and then we'll kind of get into markings and signs and all things you would see at an airport. Uh, and then uh, talk a little bit about traffic patterns and some very basic uh, radio comm stuff. Um, we can get into more detail if we have time, but uh, I think there's a, a lot of stuff here that's going to kind of eat into that. So we'll, uh, we'll get through it as best we can. So um, diving right in. So there are basically five main sources for uh, airport information. So uh, charts, the chart supplement, which used to be called the airport facilities direct, uh, Airport and Facilities Directory, the AFD, which is what I will continue to call it because that's just what I learned it as. Um, no TAMs, notices to airmen, sort of your uh, assorted weather things that you get from your airport. So ATIS, ASOS, AWOS, and then airport diagrams. So um, charts, you know, as soon as you start flying as a VFR pilot, this is going to be a very familiar site. You'll see a VFR chart like this. So I'm going to go over to Sky Vector. So, um, if everybody doesn't know, Sky Vector is like the greatest thing ever for charts. Um, you can go in here, it's all free, and when you pop in, you'll be in these uh, VFR charts, and this is the world VFR you can see right up here, and this is basically all of the sectional stitched together, but if you come up here into the New York button, because that's the chart that we're in up here in the Northeast, um, this is basically an exact copy of what you would get with a, a paper chart. So charts have a lot of information in them, but it's a, a little bit limited. Um, there's some really basic information about the airports and the airspaces and things like that. So, you know, if you zoom in here a little bit, so here's Boston. Um, I, I live up in this area. So, you know, there's obviously, this is pretty busy airspace. There's a lot of stuff going on here. And I remember the first time I saw this, this was like completely overwhelming and, and panic inducing. So um, to start with, if you come over here to this top corner of every paper chart that you can get, there's this legend that shows you what is on all of these charts. So, um, you know, things like anything that's purple doesn't have a control tower, anything that's blue does have a control tower, um, the length of the runway, or if it's grass or asphalt, private things, um, these little tick marks that indicate if there's fuel and services available, um, the colors for the airspace, and then you've got stuff uh, like the airport data. So, Zoom in here a little more, and you can see it's going to have stuff like the name, the control tower frequency, um, if there's an ATIS frequency, the length of the runway, um, the uh, altitude uh, above sea level of the airport, things like that. Um, so it's it's all really basic information. But you know, if you were flying along and really needed to land at an airport, this is the information that you need. So you know, if uh, for example you're flying along and you just happen to end up over here by Syracuse and you you know, if there's weather or something you need to land, like, well, here's the ATIS frequency, here's the control tower frequency, and you know what kind of airspace it is. And that's basically all the information that you would need to know about that airport on a basic level to contact them, figure out what's going on, learn what it's like at the airport, stuff like that. So um, again, charts, basic information, but really important. Um, so, you know, uh, I think a better example of this is probably at Boston Logan because there's a lot more stuff. So, you know, you can see right here, Logan International and it's Bravo Oscar Sierra. Um, no special VFR is allowed. So that's what this little note is right here. The control tower frequency is 128.8. ATIS is on 135.0. The longest runway is 10,100 feet. Um, you know, you know from the fact that this is a blue airport with all these lines that it, they're long runways and they're asphalt and then this solid blue circle you know the the 
blue airspace indication, the solid line, it's a class Bravo airport. Um, you can see up here at Manchester, the solid magenta line means it's a class Charlie airport, and this dashed blue line here means it's a class Delta airport. So those are the kinds of airports that you would see on the, on the sectional chart, uh, and that's the kind of information that you're going to see. Um, the uh, AFD is the most complete, sorry, before I go on, any questions about charts? Everybody, I, I assume, has seen charts. Um, no questions, and yeah, we, we cover charts in more detail in the navigation yeah. and the cross country. Yeah, so, that's what I figured. Um, yeah. yeah, we'll go into more details about that. So, sure. yep, looks okay. Still so, fine. the um, the AFD is the most complete source for airport information, and it, the uh, FAA puts these out every fifty six days. Um, back when I was learning to fly a couple of years ago, you had to buy one of these every 56 days so that it would be up to date and you would be legal, and it was a huge pain. Um, now you can just get them from the FAA website, uh, which is really nice. And all this information for uh, if you have an electronic flight bag, so ForeFlight or Garmin Pilot or something like that, um, all of this information is available in that in those programs. So all this information I have for flight, I just I don't even download it. I just have it here. So. Um, this is what the paper copy would look like. So this is the Northeast one. So you can see it's for all of these states. And it's got information about all of these airports. Um, so it's things like the name, where it is, the local time versus GMT, stuff like that. Um, it's a ton of information. So in the front of all of these books, there's this kind of legend that you can scroll down through. And you can see there's a lot of information. And then eventually on page 12 here, you can see this sample entry. And let me zoom in a little bit here. Um, so this has, this is the sample of what you would see for just a random airport. So it's things like, here's the city name, here's the airport name, um, you know, the GPS coordinates, the runways, if there's any land and hold short operation stuff, um, services like fuel or airframe or engine service, kinds of oxygen. Um, you can scroll down a little bit farther. There's all your communications information. If there's any radio uh, aids to navigation like a VOR or a TACAN or an ILS, stuff like that, um, all of that information is going to be found here. Um, there's also, at some of the larger airports, there'll be this airport diagram picture um, that shows the airport layout and the runways and taxiways and things like that. And if you come down to this uh, page 13, it has all of the, uh, what all of the, the symbols are so it's you know things you know the, the things you would expect like the runway and buildings and power lines stuff like that but also information about uh, approach lighting or where the control tower is and, and things like that so this is all of the information that you could need uh, about an airport and if you come up to this legend you see there's all these little numbers here so for things that aren't immediately clear so for example number five here just says three n you know you, you look at that that doesn't actually mean anything off the bat. So if you come down here to number five, you can see the airport location expressed as a distance and direction from the center of the city. So this underneath here, it explains what each of those uh, each of those numbers is and, and it explains what they all mean. So um, if you uh, come back here, I actually have one of these open somewhere, I thought. Yeah, here it is. So here's the one for Logan. Um, you can see this is a pretty big entry. It's that whole first page and then this thing because it's a big airport. Um, but, you know, starting at the top, it's Boston. It's Logan International, Bravo Oscar Sierra. It's a mile east of Boston. Uh, local time is five hours behind Zulu time. There's all these runways. There's lots of takeoff landing distance information here, um, which really only matters when you get into jets and stuff like that. Um, there's information about the airport. Come down here, there's all of your uh, communication frequencies. So you've got your ATIS frequencies here, and you'll notice there's an approach ATIS and a departure ATIS. So there are actually two ATIS frequencies at Logan. You've got your uh, approach departure control, tower frequencies, uh, ground, clearance, all, all the information that you could possibly need if you're going to Logan is in here. And that's the case for every single airport in the country. So not all of them are quite that long and, uh, and involved. Logan's obviously a really big airport, so, um, but that's basically what you would get out of the AFD. Um, and uh, there's this website here, which you can uh, pause the video later if you want to get to here, or you can just search for uh, Chart Supplement FAA, and that website will pop up, and you can just search for everything. Um, so NOTAMs are notices to airmen. And this is a, a, t 
time critical information which you don't know far enough ahead of time to put into a chart or into the book or something like that so it's either temporary or it's it's a pop-up thing but they are you, you can't overstate how important NOTAMs are and you have to check them as part of your pre-flight and I'm sure your flight instructors have drilled that into you and if they haven't they should um, NOTAMs are super important you have to check them and and they can really affect whether or not you can safely make the flight uh, at all so there are five kinds of NOTAMs so um, there are uh, distant NOTAMs, denotams, which is uh, affecting things like navigation facilities and airports and taxi closures um, these tend to be slightly longer uh, time scale things, but it'll be something like they're repaving a runway or a taxiway is closed or something like that, which is going on for you know a couple of days, something like that. And, and that's where you would find that information is in a distant notum. Um, FTC notums are regulatory in nature. So that's things like changes to charts um, in between when they get published and also uh, things like TFRs and you know when when you talk about how important NOTAMs are busting a TFR is a really bad day for you and you know at worst or at, at best um, you you get a number to call and they maybe uh, yell at you a little bit and take away your your pilot certificate for a little bit uh, at worst you get an F-16 coming up to say hello and that's a really terrible day so again check your NOTAMs super important um, pointer notums are a little less common, but it's basically a highlighting of another NOTAM to cross-reference for, uh, you know, if it's uh, a larger geographic area, something like that. Um, special activity airspace notums are for when you have some sort of special activity airspace like refueling tracks or military training routes or hot zones, uh, prohibited airspace, stuff like that, which is normally scheduled to be used. Uh, and then sometimes it has to be used at different times. So for example, for a refueling track, uh, a lot of times those are operational only during the day, but sometimes the military has to practice refueling at night. And so the track will be active at night and they'll have an SAA notum to let pilots know that there are gonna be airplanes flying around out uh, somewhere in formation doing circles. Uh, and then the last kind of notum are GPS notums. So that's things like service interruptions or if there are any changes to GPS approach procedures, stuff like that. Um, a couple of months ago, I guess there was like that whole big deal with the, the Navy was going to like take out all of GPS for Southern California or something um, to test some system. And there was a big uproar, but that came out through GPS notums. Um, so those are notums. Um, you can get those uh, on the FAA website. You can also get those if you call like 1-800-WEATHER-BRIEF. Uh, the briefers can talk you through them. They'll pop up in ForeFlight if you get a full weather briefing, uh, stuff like that. But again, super, super important. Um, ATIS and ASOS and AWOS. So that's things like um, the broadcasts that are made at uh, generally larger airports, um, you know, kind of really tiny airports will not have an ASOS or an AWOS frequency a lot of times, but um, they're getting more and more common because uh, it's an automated system. So eff effectively, it's a, a weather uh, observation played on a loop on a frequency, and it just plays over and over and over. And you can call up that frequency and get information from that. So at kind of the most basic level for an ASOS or an AWOS, it's literally just a computer voice reading the information out and it'll be things like the ceiling and the winds and the altimeter setting, maybe density altitude, stuff like that. Um, at like a class D or a class C or a class B airport um, with an ATIS, uh, a lot of times that'll actually be a person reading the information and you get a lot more information out of that. So things like what runways are being used, if there are visual approaches or instrument approaches being used. So that's kind of the up to the minute or in, in most cases up to the hour information about weather and the local uh, kind of the local conditions. Um, the other thing to know is that a lot of times there's a, uh, a phone number that you can call. So like right here, uh, this is for Boston Logan, this 617 number right here. Um, if you call that number, it'll play the, uh, the ATIS over your phone. So before you leave uh, your house for the airport or something, a lot of times you can call ahead and check the weather without having to, you know, be close enough to use a radio if you even have a handheld or something like that. Uh, and then finally, um, airport and taxiway diagrams are super, super, super helpful. So um, these are basically um, an illustrated condensed version of all the information in the AFD that you would need kind of immediately. So um, there's this uh, website on the FAA website, obviously, that you can look up all your 
diagram. So, you know, you put in any airport, like here's KBOS, and then it pops up right there. So here's that uh, diagram. So it's got a ton of information here, kind of starting up at the top. Obviously, this is an airport diagram in case it wasn't obvious. Um, and this is the airport it's for. This top corner has all your frequencies that you would need. And then you can see all the things like all the runways, all the taxiways. Um, there's information about, so like these little bubbles here for displaced threshold. You've got field elevation, you've got runway lengths, you've got um, the slope of the runway, you've got the magnetic heading of the runway. You, these uh, HS red box circles are hot spots. So those are areas where there's a lot of traffic and a lot of congestion. You like really have to keep your eyes out. Um, so there's a ton of information on these. Um, highly, highly recommend anytime you're taxiing at an unfamiliar airport or at a large airport or anything other than like one taxiway, one runway kind of airports, you should have this out uh, in front of you. Uh, you can obviously download them, but they're also available in ForeFlight or Garmin Pilot, stuff like that. Um, if you have like the geolocated georeference charts, like in ForeFlight, um, it'll actually put your little blue dot of where you are on the airport on the taxi diagram. And then as you're taxiing, um, you can actually see uh, where you are, where you're going. It's, it's incredibly helpful. Um, and the, the really nice thing about these is like when you're getting a taxi clearance, especially at a big airport like this, where it's confusing, you know, you kind of know where you're starting and where you're going and you can almost plan ahead of time what your taxi route is going to be. So for example, if you're up here at the GA ramp in the, the northwest and you had to come down to runway 33 left, for example, you know, you're probably going to come down this way and maybe cross here and end up down here. And maybe it won't be exactly right, but you're going to have a general idea of where you're going. And, and that gives you a head start when you're getting a, a taxi clearance. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, OK, any questions on where to find information? I blew through that pretty quickly. No, it, it looks like we're free of questions. So. OK, all right. So um, airport markings. So we'll talk about movement area and non-movement area, and then taxiway markings and signs and runway markings and signs. Um, and I'm going to go over to Google Earth and Maps and stuff like that, because it's actually a little bit easier to see. So um, here is an airport. Um, this is Hanscom Field uh, to the northwest of Boston. I fly out of here a lot. Um, so we'll zoom in and, and start looking at stuff. So on the ramp, uh, let's say that we're parked. Oh, you know what? Actually, this isn't the best airport. You can't zoom in that far. We're going to do this one instead. Here's Beverly. This is the airport I generally fly out of. So here we are on the ramp. And uh, the flying club that I'm in, we have uh, these three parking spaces for airplanes. And one of our airplanes is out in this picture. But um, when you walk up to the airplanes, you're sitting on the ramp. And you're in what's called the non-movement area. And what that means is that you're in the area that air traffic control does not care about for all intents and purposes. They don't control it. Um, you can move around here, you can taxi, you can do whatever you want basically in this area and ATC does not care. Um, so this is gonna be the ramp, the parking, hangars, stuff like that. And the way that you can tell the delineation is this line right here. And you can see it's a solid line and a dashed line right next to each other. And what that means is that on the solid line side of things, you're in the non-movement area. The movement area, which is on the dash line side, is the area that's the taxiways and the runways, and that's what ATC controls cares about. And when I say ATC, I'm talking about the tower and ground control and things like that. This is the area that they control, that they care about, that you need a clearance to go into. So for example, uh, we parked our airplanes down here, and we fuel up at the self-serve fuel pump up here. And so when I come to the airport and I have to get gas in the airplane, I can start up the airplane, taxi out here and taxi up to the, the fuel ramp here. And I don't have to talk to anybody. I don't have to put on a headset. I don't even have to turn on my avionics. Keep an eye out for other airplanes, obviously, but you don't need to talk to anybody because you don't need any clearance to move around in the non-movement area. Um, it's kind of a dumb name, but that's what it's called. And, and the way that you can think about it is uh, you need permission to cross over the solid line. You generally ever, you never need permission basically to cross from the dash side onto the solid side. So if you were out here on a, on a taxiway and you were coming back to the ramp, you can just taxi over this line and go to your parking space and shut down and you're fine. But going the other way, you need ATC clearance. So that's the movement area versus the non-movement area. Does that make sense to everybody? Yep. Okay, great. So 
taxiways uh, are this area, obviously, kind of out here. And I will actually head back. Here we go to Enscombe Field because this is better illustrated here. So, taxiway center lines or taxiways in general use yellow paint um, for almost everything, and that yellow and black paint, and that's the way that taxiways are designated. And uh, runways use white paint. Um, obviously, this area down here, this is a road that's not a runway. It uses white paint, I know. But uh, in terms of airport airplane areas, yellow is for taxiways for paint, and uh, white is for runways. So you can see here on the ramp, um, these yellow lines are taxiway center lines. So when you're taxiing around, you know, good practices have your nose wheels centered on these taxiway center lines. And you can see when you come to an intersection, they'll kind of peel off in different directions, and that's basically what you would do. So if you were coming up here and you had clearance to cross this whole short line for the uh, the movement area, you'd come up here, and if you're turning to the right, you just keep your nose wheel right on this line and come up that way. And that's just taxiway center lines. It's really uh, pretty, pretty obvious and intuitive. So you can see this airplane's taxing down here, and here's a pretty complicated intersection, right? There's There's a lot of stuff going on. There's two directions. So the way that you can tell where you are and what you're doing is with the signage. So obviously, you can use the uh, the airport. Oh, sorry, Mark has a question here. Every green line adjacent to the yellow line going to the green ramp. Yes. So every airport will have different kind of layouts for transients and for things like that. So for example, like at Hanscom, yeah, this green line right here that indicates the transient parking. This red area right here is actually a TSA controlled area because there's a terminal here. So like you're not allowed to cross this red line ever kind of thing. Um, yeah, so things like that, the, the green line for transient, stuff like that, you will also see on the airport. That's a really good point. So the way that you can tell where you are on taxiways are with taxiway signage. So these are both upside down, of course. We'll spin this around a little bit. All right. So all taxiway signs are going to look the same. So there's there's sort of two types. There's a black background with yellow letters, and then there's a yellow background with black letters. So in this particular case, well, in all cases, the black background signs with the yellow letters are the taxiway location. So that's the taxiway that you are on. So in this case, you're on taxiway Tango. And then the other way, the yellow with the black letters is the direction sign. So and here, in this case, you're on taxiway Tango coming up this way, and then this arrow, so this way, this taxiway is Juliet. Um, all taxiways are the same, so it's always this yellow and black color scheme. Uh, this can obviously get more complicated when you have like a much busier intersection, but that's what it always means. So, you know, we look here, uh, spin this around, so it's up. So here we are. This. We're on taxiway Echo here, and this is taxiway Sierra here, and down here, this is Juliet here. So that's that's what those signs always mean. And it's a little hard to tell, but if you zoom in here a little bit, there's kind of this little blob down here. This is the actual taxiway sign, and they look exactly like this. So if you just took this and put it vertically on a sign, that's what it would look like. So again, black background with yellow letters is the taxiway that you are on, and yellow background with black letters is the intersection that you're coming up to. So it's the the indicator of what the direction is. So that's the taxiway sign so you know where you are. Um, all, all airports will have this. Um, it's more at bigger airports, but you'll see things. This is not the best one, actually. But it's called an enhanced center line. We'll come down here to 2-9. Oh, it was a busy day. Um, so you can see that the taxiway center line comes up here. And then this last 150 feet, it'll be the center line and then also a dash line on either side. That's basically letting you know that you're about to get to a hold short line. It's a, like a warning. It's the yellow, the yellow light of the traffic light, effectively, of taxiways. Um, not all airports will have that, but if it does, it's kind of nice to know. Um, you can see here in this area, the taxiway gets much wider out in this area. And you can see there's this dash yellow line, it's kind of wide, and then the very closely spaced black and yellow dash line. So the yellow dash line here is the actual, technically, the edge of the taxiway. So you can see that the width here 
just continues all the way around here. And this is the same thing that was, was happening down here. So this is technically the taxiway. And this area over here is the run-up area. And every airport does this differently. Sometimes it's delineated like this, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's literally just, it gets wider and there's just extra ramp. Um, but the point of this is when the taxiway gets wider like this, you can pull your plane over to do your checks and your run up and stuff like that. Whereas at an airport like this, there's a lot of jet traffic and the jet guys don't need to do run ups and they get really annoyed if you're in their way. So what you can do here is you taxi up, you pull over to do your run up and the jet guys go by you and they take off and everybody's happy. Um, this, uh, you know, this is just like that movement area line, except it doesn't have the solid part to it. So you can cross back and forth freely over this line. So you pull over, you do your run up, you, you come back onto the taxiway and that's totally fine. That's the most convenient run up area I have ever seen at an airport. Yeah, this is a really good one. Um, <laughs> it's good. Yeah. And a lot of airports don't even have a run up area. Do the run up area holding short of the uh, runway. So it really right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, this one is really good, but you know, you come down uh, over to like two, three here and that's technically I think a closed area right now. So really what you'd have to do is just kind of pull up to here and kind of angle into the wind do your run up and then just kind of come back. And that's what happens at a lot of airports. So this line right here, obviously that's a runway. So this line right here, this double version of that movement area line is a runway hold short line. Um, and, and the only difference is it's just doubles, but same thing applies where you can't cross the solid line without permission from ATC and you can cross the dash line without permission. So when you're taxiing, you'll be given a taxi clearance to taxi to runway 29, you'll end up up here and then you pull over here and you hold short. So, you know, if you had to do a run up, you'd come over here, do your run up, come back to the taxiway, pull up to here and then stop. And that's when you would want to talk to the tower to get clearance. And at a bigger airport that has both a ground control and a tower controller like this, that's where the switch is made between the two frequencies. So when you're taxiing, you talk to a ground controller when you're getting ready to take off. So basically when you're on a runway, you're talking to a tower controller. So that's kind of the difference of this is where you would make that frequency switch is right at this whole short line. Um, this uh, red and white thing right here is a runway sign. Um, right here, we're at the approach end of 29. So all you see is red background with white letters. And, and that's just, that is the runway. And it's, uh, you can't really see it, but there's a sign right here that again, it's this exact same thing, just stuck up on a sign right here. Um, if we come up to here to an intersection, so again, you can see enhanced center line and the, the taxiway center line, that runway hold short line right here. And then this is this uh, red and white is the, the runway. And the side that the number is on is the side of the approach end of the runway. So for example, in this particular case, the approach end of 29 is off to your right and the approach end of 11 is off to your left. And if you come over to the other side, it's the opposite. So 29 is over here and 11 is up here. But you know, if we flip this upside down or right side up, there we go. The numbers are backwards technically from this side because the approach end of 29 is over here. So that's the basics. Uh, you can see there's another really good run-up area over here. So again, that dash yellow line is the taxiway edge. And then here's a really good run-up area. Um, so that's, uh, that's taxiway, most taxiway signs. Um, another one, which you'll see a little bit less frequently. And I have to get a little oriented again because I know where it is. Uh, here we go. Is this ladder looking uh, paint line. This is for the ILS critical area. So it's it's these two uh, two bars across the taxiway with the double, the double line like ladder rungs. I guess it looks uh, technically more like that if you're taxiing up to it. So this, this is for the ILS critical area. And what that means is this uh, structure right here is an ILS antenna. So it's a localizer and a glide slope. So sideways and up and down for an airplane landing in bad weather conditions, for example. So that, that signal comes out from this box. And if you had an airplane parked right in this area, it would block that signal. And that's bad, obviously. <coughs> Excuse me. So... Um, a lot of times you'll see these at airports with uh, instrument approaches and it's a little unclear what you're supposed to do because it's this big scary line, but can I cross it? Can I not cross it? Um, 
if you're flying on a VFR day and nobody's doing instrument approaches, you're totally good. You can cross it, not a problem at all. Um, if ATC, if ground control needs you to hold short of this, they will tell you. And if they don't tell you to hold short, you don't need to. So, you know, if if you were taxing down here and they say, hold short of the ILS critical area, this is what they're talking about. And you need to stop before that, because if you go past it, you could interfere with uh, an approach. Uh, and that, that's a bad day, obviously. So, Mark, there, there's a question that came in, and you might want to go back to the approach end of 2.9 real quick. Sure. So Keith is asking, can a, can a general aviation aircraft on the run-up side call for takeoff there? Yes, you can. So it is good practice to come back to the runway center or to the taxiway center line, but technically this is all still movement area. So you're still holding short of 2.9. You're still technically in the movement area. So yes, you if you were if you were this airplane right here and you'd finish your run up, yeah, you could just call the tower and come up here and you'd be fine. Um, where that gets a little messy is if you're in a situation like this, where you've got a, a jet holding short and you're over here and both of you have called the tower that you're ready to take off, well, who goes first? And realistically, the jet is going to go because his fuel costs, he, he burns fuel way faster than you do and you're just out of luck. Um, but if you were parked here holding short and another airplane comes up, it's sort of, you know, etiquette is first in, first out kind of thing. So... Yes, you can do it, but it's really just good practice to come back to the taxiway. Um, the other thing is when you are uh, when you're stacked up like this, you know, there's a, a bunch of airplanes here stacked up doing your run up. But it's really good practice that when you finish, you get out of the way so that the next guy taxiing down has space to come in to do his run up. So if all of these guys are just hanging out here waiting to, to take off, there's nowhere for the, the next three airplanes that are coming down to, to go into the run up area and do their run up. Yeah, and, and I guess this is a really good example because, if you're, so ignore the jet for a second, if you're a bunch of Cessnas waiting there in line, if you're airplane number two, and you're switching over to tower and you want to let them know that you're ready to go, maybe airplane number one um, is not quite done with his run up, but he's ahead of you, you can always call the tower and say, you know, this is Cessna one, two, three, four, five, holding short of two, nine in the sequence, right? So let them know that you're not at that hold short line. You're not the next airplane to go. But uh, whenever you come up, let them know. Right. And and that's also a good point is, you know, like, so they do a lot of student uh, pilot training at this airport. So if this is like a brand new student and he doesn't know where any of the buttons and switches are, this run up is going to take 15 minutes. And this guy is an experienced pilot with 20,000 hours. He's going to be done in like two minutes. So this guy is going to come up and do his run up. He doesn't want to have to wait for student pilot Joe Schmo to finish. So he can just pull back out onto the taxiway and tell the tower he's ready to go. Make sense? All right. Um, so uh, there are also some of these weird, we're going to talk about runway markings separately, but there are some of these other weird marks kind of around runways that are really important. So uh, the first are these chevrons like this. Um, this is a blast pad or overrun area. Um, and this is an area that really should not ever be used by airplanes. Um, for whatever reason, like the, the strength of the concrete isn't high enough to support the aircraft weight, stuff like that, but it's not suitable for aircraft use. So when you see this, uh, you know, you would taxi up here to the threshold of the runway. So if you wanted the whole runway, you could taxi up here right to this edge and turn around, but you should not go on this area um, not to be used by airplanes. It's, um, let's see. I'm going to head back to Boston Logan because they've got more of these things. And you can see there, there are these blast pads at all, all four runway approach ends at, at Hanscom. Okay, back to Logan. Uh, and again, you can see here, uh, going back a little bit, but taxiway center lines, enhanced center lines. Here's the taxiway signs, the runway hold short. All of this stuff is exactly the same, even at this gigantic airport, as it was at some of the smaller airports. Uh, okay, so this yellow line right here, or this, uh, sorry, the yellow carrot uh, triangle is a uh, a moved threshold. And what that means is that the threshold used to be back here, and then they moved it somewhere else. Um, so that can happen for a number of reasons. I actually know uh, if you come up to 15, 
Yeah, one five left right here. And we, uh, we can go back in time a little bit. Um, so this is how it is currently. So you can see here's some blast pad and then they move the threshold up to here. If you go back in time a little ways, the threshold used to be way back here. And then they changed that because there's a taxiway here and that was really annoying for people. So that's what those little arrows mean. Um, so again, this area you can taxi on, but you're not supposed to use it as part of the runway. This blast pad area you should never taxi on. Um, so those are what those two, uh, the two triangle type symbols are. And then the final thing is a displace threshold. And that's these white arrows that lead up to the white triangles. Um, and what this means is that the threshold has moved very similarly from all the way back here to all the way up here. But the, the difference is that you can use this area for takeoff and for landing rollout. So what that means is if you were taking off on four right here, and you really needed every inch, you can taxi up to right here, stop your airplane, get the power all the way in, and start your takeoff roll from here, and then just continue down the runway and take off. Um, if you were coming the other way and you landed on uh, 2 2 left, again, there's this uh, displaced threshold, but you land here and you roll out, and you can, you can continue your landing roll all the way down this area. That's totally fine. The only thing you cannot do in this area is land on it. So if you're coming in to land on four right, your wheels better not touch down before this threshold or you will be in trouble. Um, and sometimes, again, that's because the, the strength isn't high enough or it's just a traffic problem, whatever it is, don't land in this area, but you can take off from here. Any questions about any of those? Um, no, just, just a couple points to go back to the uh, when we were talking about um, the airplanes in sequence. Mm -hmm. That airplane sitting at the hold short might be waiting for his uh, IFR release. Yes. That's why he's just in there. So that was a good point by Mark. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing is the arrows that you see here on four right might be due to noise abatement or other other types of stuff like that so that's that's why they have those there you know? yeah absolutely yeah. um there are a variety of reasons for them but regardless of what they are don't land in that spot yeah. mm -hmm. okay um let's go back to my presentation here because i think yeah we're ready to talk about runway markings so there are kinds of runways um, there are visual runways there are non-precision runways and there are precision runways. So uh, something like a visual runway obviously is the simplest kind of runway. Um, it's at a, a runway that doesn't have any instrument approaches to it. Non-precision runways have only non-precision approaches like a localizer or a VOR or something like that. And then a precision runway obviously has a precision instrument approach to it. So an ILS or an MLS or something like that. Um, the way that you can tell the difference between them is in the runway markings. So a uh, visual runway, you can see it has the runway number. So here's runway two and runway two zeros down, obviously the other end, and there's a center line and that's about it. Um, you can add some more markings at some airports, but this is kind of the minimum and this is a, a small airport and this is just what you would have on that runway. Uh, a non-precision runway is a little bit more complicated. So it has, the numbers and the center line, just like a, a visual runway, but you have this threshold marking here and you've got this aiming point here. So the aiming point is when you're in a jet and, and you're kind of, this is what you would aim at, even if you're not necessarily touching down there, but it's just the aim point of the runway. Uh, and then finally, this super old picture of a precision runway, um, even more complicated. So there's the threshold stuff, there's your aiming point, and then there's some of these distance bars. So if we come back here to Logan, you can see um, here's a precision runway. So there's the, the numbers, there's the threshold things, um, some of these distance bars down here, you've got your aiming point. Um, there are also these sidelines. So the, the runway is actually like painted out as a rectangle. Um, if you come up here to uh, one five left, this is a, uh, this is a visual runway, so there's no instrument approaches to this runway. So all it has is the, the numbers and the center lines, and that's it. So um, runway markings are all pretty standard. Really, the most important thing is that you make sure you are landing on the correct runway by using the number right here, and that you don't land before the end, which is this bar right here. Those are the really big things, and then obviously don't go off the other end down here. Um, Runways are, I, I swear, of 
the hardest thing that I've had to do in learning how to fly is just finding the stupid airport from the air. And even when you find it, figuring out which runway is which can be really hard. So always look at the approach end, figure out what runway you're looking at, line it up with your compass. That really helps orient you. But that's the basics of runway markings. They're actually pretty simple. Um, so I guess, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, this. so this is all of the, uh, the runway markings on that precision runway and kind of what they all are. Um, and then the only other runway sign that you'll sometimes see are these uh, uh, runway remaining signs. So these will be on the side of the runway. They're in thousand foot increments and it's how many thousands of feet are left on a runway. So in this particular case, you would have 1000 feet of runway left. Um, at like a small airport, you won't have these, but I used to do a lot of flying out of a, an airport that used to be an old uh, Air Force bomber base. It had a 12,000 foot runway. And so you would start at number 12 and work your way down from there. So if you're a big, heavy, fast airplane, you really care about this. If you're in a Cessna going, you know, 60 knots on approach, you probably don't care. <laughs> Do you have something to add, Chris? No, I guess, I guess just whenever you look at these markings, and this is a good place to look at it. So you see the two zero left, you see the center line, those first hash marks, um, those are commonly called the 500 foot markers. Right. And the big bars that are solid, those are the thousand foot markers. Yeah. So whenever your instructor tells you, I want you to put the plane down on the thousand foot markers, it's those big thick bars that he's talking about, the solid bars. Yeah. And that's a really good, uh, that's a really good point is that you can, uh, you can judge the length of a runway if you have no other idea based on those lines. So, you know, you know, this is 500 and this is a thousand and that's 1500. And then there's a whole bunch of space in the middle before you get to the other end. You've got tons of room. If this is a much shorter runway and you only had, you know, for example, the first set and the aim point and this, it's you, you can figure out kind of just based on looking at it how long the runway is based on how far apart these are spaced and how much space you have down the runway. Yeah, and and Mark adds a, another good point is um, I'll say usually Mark <laughs> usually the thousand foot marker is where the VASI or the Pappy aims you to. Um, so yeah. we said that's the aim point. That's where the VASI takes you down to. My home airfield. Yeah. The Vassy does not take you to the thousand foot marker, um, but in most cases that's true. That that's that's the aiming point. So that's where the uh, glides any glide slope is going to take you to. Mm -hmm. Right, and and you can see that even though this is the aiming point, if you look where all the tire marks are, they're really kind of in this this whole area here, and that's because you're you're aiming for this point on the runway, but then you flare and you float it in, and it takes a little longer to get down. So you know the the good rule of thumb obviously is land in the first third of the runway kind of thing. Um, so that's why these tire marks are so spread out is that even though you're aiming here, this isn't slam into the runway here. This is aim for this and then flare and land like a real pilot. So, so Mark, what, what taxi mark are you talking about? I mean, oh, yeah. so in between right here. Uh, yeah. four left and four right, um, the big taxi mark. Yeah, that is this, pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this taxiway is obviously very large and heading in the exact same direction and it's parallel so i guess they've had some problems in the past where somebody lines up on the wrong thing uh when they're coming in for landing or takeoff or something like that so yeah i that is a, a pretty funny and unique uh marking that they have there yeah um all right really quickly let's talk about night ops because this is super intimidating if you're not used to it because um, like you look at this and this is just a mess so um for taxiways, the blue lights are taxiway edges, and at larger airports, you'll see these green lights as taxiway center lines. So those will be in-ground, um, flush with the surface lights for center line. So when you're looking at this picture, you can see. Um, so here is a center line. So you've got a row of blue lights here and a row of blue lights here. So you could taxi. You would be taxiing down this taxiway right here. So uh, this picture here does a really good job of, of showing that. So these are your taxiways in between the blue. Here's your runway. So uh, runway continues to be white. So the, uh, this is a pretty simple runway. So you've got your runway edged lights are in white. Um, down here, uh, you can see that they turn yellow. Um, on a, a runway with an instrument approach, the last 2,000 feet will be this amber color so that you know you're getting towards the end of the runway if you had low visibility. Um, 
the uh, threshold at the approach end will be green, and then the uh, the threshold at the departure end where you need to stop, um, those lights will be red. Uh, and then you can see there's the, the VASI here, and these are some just approach lights to get you towards the runway. But this is like the simplest uh, form of that. Um, you can get to something, so this is a, a precision runway, and you can see it, it gets quite a bit more complicated. So not only do you have the, uh, the threshold and the side lights, but you also have the center line in ground lights, just like those taxiway center lights. Uh, and then you even have aim point bars here as uh, lights. Uh, and then here's kind of a, a in-between runway. So there's only center line lights and, and edge lights, and you've got some approach lights down here. But again, white lights for runway, blue lights for taxiway, green lights for taxiway center line. And that's about it for lights. Um, taxiing at night on especially unfamiliar airports can be really frustrating because you, you don't know where you are. It's really hard to see. Um, so taxiway diagrams are super important. Go really slow. Make sure your taxi lights and your landing lights work. Those are super helpful. Take your time. But uh, just remember, stay in between the blue lights and you'll be OK. Um, and all right, so any questions so far? We good? Um, nope, looks pretty good. All right, great. So um, we'll talk about untowered airports a little bit, because um, these are obviously uh, simpler. So let's head up to Hampton Airfield. So this is the airport that I learned uh, where to fly. I did my primary training up here. It's a tiny little airport. Um, and uh, when I learned to fly, I did my first 25 hours in a Piper Cub, which didn't have a radio or an electrical system or anything. So um, totally Nordo, just basic flying. So this is a really good example of what you would do at an airport like this. So uh, you know, from what we were talking about before, you can see here are your taxiways. Here's your runway. This is that, uh, that runway that we saw a bit earlier. Um, you can actually see that there is a uh, kind of this hold short line here. Um, this is an untowered airport, so it's not that air traffic control clears you onto the runway. You clear yourself onto the runway, but this is a, a reminder of you are about to enter a runway. So when you're operating at an untowered airport like this, you're in charge of figuring out what runway you're going to use, what taxiways you're going to use to get there, stuff like that. Um, and the way that you can do that is you look at the windsock, you listen to the ADIS or the ASOS, um, you can see what other airplanes are doing in the area. So if there are uh, you know, five or six airplanes in the pattern and they're all using runway two here, you should probably taxi to runway two and that would be how you would take off. So when you're operating in an untowered airport like this, technically you don't need to call anything on the radio. You could just get in your airplane and taxi out and go fly. And that's totally legal. It is excellent practice. If you have a radio, you should use it. So the way that you operate at an untowered airport is you're effectively letting other traffic know, this sort of nebulous blob of other traffic that may or may not be in the area, what you are doing. You're, you're letting them know your plans ahead of time so that they don't do something stupid and, and you won't crash. So for example, if you were going to taxi down to runway two here, so you're out on the ramp here, and you pull onto the taxiway. So the first thing you want to do is call the, the traffic. And, and when you make this call, you start with the name of the airport. Because So all radio calls, obviously, it's uh, when you make a radio call, it's who you are calling, who you are, what you want, and sometimes where you are. So uh, in this particular case, you would say, you know, Hampton traffic, Cessna, 12345, uh, at the ramp, taxiing to runway two, Hampton. And it's really good practice to both start and end your radio call at an untowered airfield with the name of the airport so that you know a lot of these tiny airports will be uh, pretty close to each other and sometimes they use the same frequency for a, a CTAF frequency so using the airport name on the on the front and the end helps everybody in the area know what you're talking about what you know if you're at a nearby airport you don't care that I'm taxiing to runway two here because I'm not at that airport so um, start and end with the, the airport name is really good practice. So you've, you've told everybody that you're taxiing down here, you taxi down here and do your run up, and then you're ready to go. So it's a very similar call where you're telling everybody where you are, who you are, and what you're about to do. So you could say, you know, Hampton traffic, Cessna 12345, departing runway two to the north, Hampton. So that radio call is telling everybody in the area that you're at Hampton Airfield, you're going to take off from runway two, and you're going off to the north. 
So that's like the basic, the most basic of radio calls. Um, you know, I can, from personal experience, you know, my first 25 hours, I flew with no radio. So when I finally got into an airplane with a radio, I was terrified and I, I made such a mess of it. It was horrible. Um, being good on the radio is all about confidence and knowing what you need to say ahead of time and knowing what to expect somebody to come back to you with. So practicing uh, on the ground, running through radio calls in your head, there are some really good books, there's services like Pilot Edge. Um, those are all huge helps to get you comfortable on the radio. And it helps you really feel like a real pilot, you know, like you're playing with the, the real pilots when you can make a radio call and you sound good because, you know, everybody has either heard the person or been the person of like, um, uh, Cessna, uh, but nobody wants to be that guy. So practicing is really helpful. So um, that's how th those are the basically the only two radio calls that you would need to make operating VFR. Uh, out of an untowered airport. And if you're coming into an untowered airport, you know, you would call 10 miles out and say something like Hampton traffic, Cessna 12345, 10 miles to the south landing, runway two. So that's, again, you're letting everybody know where you are, where you're going, what you want to do. Um, when you're operating out of an untowered airport, the important thing to figure out is the direction of the traffic pattern. Um, and you can go back to either the chart or to uh, the um, the AFD. So if you go into the AFD, I have to find it. Actually, here we go. Let's do this. Do, do. So let's see if the AFD is it in here. I thought I had it up. It may have gone away from me. All right. Let's just. So we can go here, go into here. All right, so seven Bravo three. So you look this up uh, ahead of time, obviously, when you're doing your flight planning, because you know that's where you're going to go. And you come to here to Hampton Airfield, and here you can see runway two two zero. And there's some trees, and the threshold is displaced, and there are more trees. But that's all it says. So that means left-hand traffic pattern. That's the standard. Um, you can see up here at Franconia. Runway 1836, 18 18 doesn't say anything, 36 right traffic. So that means that runway 36 are using a right hand traffic pattern. So this is a really important thing because if you were flying at Franconia and you ended up in left traffic for 36, you're not where you're supposed to be. And I happen to know at Franconia, there are a bunch of mountains there. And if you did left traffic for 36, you could hit a mountain. So Traffic patterns can be because of terrain clearance, they can be because of noise abatement, they can be for any number of reasons, but it's really important to know which side of the runway you should be on when you're flying. Uh, at a towered airport, they will tell you which side you should be on. So, Another, another good point is like um, traffic differences. So like my home field, uh, airplanes use left traffic, helicopters, ultralights, Anything that's not an airplane uses right traffic. So you don't want to get in a situation where you're in the same traffic pattern as helicopters and ultralights. So right. that's exactly. why it's important to understand what the right traffic versus yeah. traffic is. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and again, you know, left traffic versus right traffic, all that means is that's the direction of the turns you're making. So if you're taking off from runway two with left traffic, and you were doing a, a closed pattern to do touch and goes or something. You take off from two, you take a left turn on a crosswind, you take a left turn on the downwind, a left turn on a base, a left turn on a final, and you've landed. Right traffic, obviously, you're just making a right turn. So those are the difference in the traffic patterns. But where you find that information is in the AFD. Um, or sometimes just from local knowledge. You know, if you're if you came into Hampton, you could ask a, a flight instructor or somebody in the office, hey, which direction is the traffic pattern here? And they will tell you. Okay. Um, so untowered airports work. They're really they're pretty simple. There's obviously not a whole lot going on, um, and you're in charge. Um, the the thing I would like to stress about untowered airports is always keep an eye out for no radio traffic or people that just don't want to talk on the radio. Um, there's nobody controlling anything, so you need to be extra diligent to check. So I know at, at this airport. 
there's a lot of people flying cubs and, and airports or uh, airplanes with no radio. So, you know, before you pull out on the runway, you better make sure that final is clear and you better make sure that base even is clear because you don't want to have a, a collision on the runway. You know, one of, one of the worst uh, aircraft disasters in history was two airplanes taxiing into each other and there was a taxiing airplane and a taking off airplane and they hit each other and it was awful. So always keep an eye out for that sort of thing, especially at untowered airports. Um, towered airports, on the other hand, are a bit more complicated. So um, there are clearances that you have to get. Um, there's a lot more going on. So the first thing that you would do at a towered airport like this is you get the weather, obviously. You need to know what the weather is. And when there's an ATIS broadcast like this, the they will say something like, you know, Hanscom Field Information Alpha or Bravo or Charlie, whatever it is, every time the weather changes, it gets a new code. And when you are calling up ground control, you're telling them that you have the current weather by saying, you know, Hanscom field or Hanscom ground Cessna 12345 taxi with golf or taxi with alpha. That's telling them you have information alpha. So you know what the current winds are, you know what the altimeter setting is, you know where everybody is headed, what runways are in use, things like that. So the first thing you're doing is checking the weather, write all that information down, it's super important. You then need to get from where you are on the ramp to where you're going. So for example, if we're parked down here and we're going to runway 29 all the way down here, you know, we probably need to come up here and come down here and do our run up down here like we saw. So you come back to your uh, airport diagram. Here's our taxi diagram. Let's rotate you. There we go. So you can see up here, here are all your frequencies. So really quickly, clearance delivery is generally something you only need if you're getting an IFR clearance. So for a VFR pilot at an airport like this, you don't need to talk to clearance delivery. Um, at bigger airports like it, at Logan or JFK or LAX, it's different, but generally at class C and class D airports, you'll be talking to ground control. So here, the ground control frequency is one to 1.7. So you would get the, the ATIS here on 124.6, and then you would call up ground control. So if you're parked here on the west ramp, you'd say, you know, handsome ground, Cessna 12345, on the west ramp, taxi for takeoff, I have information alpha. So again, you're letting them know you have the current weather, you're letting them know where you are, you're letting them know where you want to go, what you're doing. Um, and they're going to come back with a taxi clearance. And this is where it's really nice to have the airport diagram up because you can write down the taxi clearance and then trace it and see exactly where you're going to want to go. And this is incredibly important at towered, airplane, at towered uh, airfields to know where you're going because if you make a wrong turn, you could end up on a runway, you could end up nose to nose with another airplane and airplanes don't have reverse. All sorts of bad things can happen. So you could, they would come back and say something like, you know, Cessna 12345, taxi to runway 29 via Sierra Echo. So you right here on the west ramp, you're going to come up Sierra, you're going to come up Echo, and here you are at runway 29. That's, uh, that's a very basic taxi clearance that you could get. Um, but writing all that down and then tracing it, seeing where you're supposed to go on the taxiway diagram is the best thing that you can do to make sure that you know where you're going. Um, when you get a taxi clearance, it will when it's to a runway, your clearance will start with the runway. So if you're taxiing to runway 29, they will start your clearance with taxi to runway 29 via. So that is where you're going. It is possible that you can have an intersection departure. So for example, if you were, I mean, this is a, this is a bad example because this runway is not that long, but you could imagine if this is a much longer runway, you could taxi down to golf here and take off on runway 29 at golf. And that would be your taxi clearance. So they could say something like taxi to runway 29 at golf via Sierra Echo Golf. So you'd be coming up Sierra, down Echo, up to golf. Again, you'd stop at runway 29 at that hold short line. You can't go onto the runway yet, but that would be your taxi clearance for an intersection departure. Um, the other thing that can happen is you can have what's called a hold short. And it is very important to read back all runway holding instructions. It is required, as you can see right here. And they will say that in the ATIS broadcast. You know, at the end of the ATIS, it will, it will literally say, you must read back all hold short instructions. So for example, if you were right here on the west ramp and you needed to go to runway 11, 
you had to cross runway five here. So your taxi would be a taxi to runway one one via Sierra, Mike, Echo, hold short runway five. And you have to read that clearance back. You have to tell them that you understand you are holding short of runway five. And what that means is that your clearance will be Sierra, Mike, Echo, one one, but you're gonna stop right here until the tower or until the ground control tells you to cross runway five. It is super important that you understand that. It is super important that you stop. It is super important that you read that back. If you don't read back your hold short clearances, the ground controllers will yell at you. It is legally required that you read those back. That is something the FAA mandates. So always know if you get a hold short clearance, that's what they're talking about. And it's really important that you do that. I guess the only thing I'll add on there is, and I'm sorry if I'm stepping on you. No, no. <laughs> is sometimes the controllers are really busy. So they'll give you a taxi clearance. Again, you're at the west ramp, and they'll say, taxi to runway 11, Tara, Mike, and Echo, right? They didn't tell you to hold short, nor did they tell you to cross runway 5. In that case, do not cross runway 5 unless you hear that you are cleared. Yeah. When you go down the Sierra and you turn on Mike, when you're approaching runway five, if they haven't given you clearance to cross, contact them and ask them if you are cleared to cross. Never ever cross a runway without an explicit clearance to cross. Yeah. And it is also, if you're unsure, like, even if you read back a hold short clearance, but you had a long taxi and you weren't sure you couldn't remember if you had been cleared or not, it is totally okay for you to stop short and then ask the ground controller, am I cleared to cross this runway? They would much rather you do that than accidentally cross a runway that you shouldn't. So don't feel bad about double checking and making sure. Um, at more complicated airports, so uh, if we go back to Boston here, um, you know, it's possible you could have to cross more than runway, more than one runway at a time, you will only get clearance for one crossing. So if you had to cross, you know, I will say on parallel runways, sometimes they will let they will give you a clearance to cross both. But if, for example, you were, I don't know, let's say you were, this is a bad example, actually. Yeah, let's say you were here and you had to come all the way down here. You know, you would get a clearance to cross one five left and one five right, and you could come down here, but they will not give you clearance to cross four left until you're over here. So it'll be one runway crossing clearance at a time. So they'll say cross one five left and one five right, hold short runway four left. A lot of times what'll happen is as soon as you get across here, they will then tell you cross four left, but it's only gonna be one at a time. Yeah, and, and at a busier airport like Boston Logan or JFK, or, not that you're going to fly out of there a lot, but also understand that you're going to end it off between multiple ground and multiple tower frequencies as you taxi. So pay attention to, um, you know, Cessna 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, cross one way left, contact tower, blah, 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 blah. You'll contact tower, they'll clear you to cross one five right they'll hand you off to another ground frequency so when you're at a busier airport just pay attention to any um monitor or contact tower instructions as well yeah, yeah i would say i've i've flown in and out of logan a couple of times and it's a very weird obviously a very weird experience but even the way that they handle their taxi things are strange because you will hear so you'll get a clearance on clearance delivery and then they will tell you to monitor ground and you you switch over to your ground frequency, you don't say anything, and eventually a ground controller will say your tail number and tell and give you a taxi clearance. And then you read it back and then they'll say monitor ta you know, monitor you you taxi and they'll tell you monitor tower and you don't say anything, then the tower calls you. So at big airports like this, the, the procedure totally goes out the window. But in general, you just need to know who you're supposed to talk to where. So taxiways are ground, runways are tower. That's actually a good point that that we need to make is whenever you're um, communicating at a, at a towered airport, there's a difference between contact and monitor. Yeah. Whenever you're told to contact somebody, you contact them. So like if you're on clearance delivery, they'll say contact ground when ready to taxi. So you contact ground, you say 
who you are, where you are, where you want to go. If they give you an instruction to monitor, you switch to that frequency, but you don't say anything. You don't contact them and say, hey, I'm Cessna 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and I'm here. You just monitor it. Yeah. And and that's a, that's a difference. The, the implied contact, I guess, is when ground clears you to taxi to a runway at a smaller field and you get to that whole short line, it, it's assumed that you're going to contact tower at that point. Yeah. Uh, they tell you otherwise. Some airports ground will sit there and say, taxi to runway 29, um, contact when you're done with your run up, right? Or when you're ready. So you'll go over there, you'll do um, your run up, and then you contact ground again and say, you know, run up complete and ground will sit there and say, okay, monitor tower on whatever, whatever, whatever. That, that's something that we don't normally point out. That's yeah, good. it's it's worth recognizing that a lot of times these controllers are monitoring multiple frequencies or they're talking to somebody else in the cab. There's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes that you can't necessarily hear. So, you know, the if a ground controller says like monitor tower that could be because the tower is dealing with a, a landing airplane and they can't talk to you or if they say you know monitor ground maybe the ground controller is giving a really complicated taxi clearance or somebody's giving somebody an ifr clearance and getting a readback so just be patient with the controllers but recognize that sometimes they're talking to other people and they're not just ignoring you yeah i guess in, in bigger airports ground and tower could be in separate rooms yeah in a lot of smaller um even smaller bravos and deltas and charlies they're standing right next to each other so yeah uh, it, it's it's not like it's a big communication gap between the controllers right and the other thing is that even just the complete opposite side of that is that some like delta airports the tower controller and the ground controller is the same guy and when he broadcast it actually he can hear both frequencies but he's only broadcasting on one so you know you could land and he'll say you know taxi to the ramp stay this frequency on the tower frequency even though technically you should switch to ground but he doesn't care because it's the same guy so okay so you've got a taxi clearance and you've you've managed to taxi we'll say down to two nine and you've done your run up the taxi the taxi clearance makes since oh wait mark says transponder on yeah that is a really good uh, that's a good point and actually something uh really interesting so this asdex in use note down here so at bigger airports they've started using a system called asdex which basically uses your transponder the same way that an uh, approach controller would use where it it basically puts a little dot on an airport map for them. And the reason that they do this is that the airports are so big that they can't necessarily see every airplane from where they are. And sometimes the, the controller's not even on the airport, it's in a remote facility somewhere. So when you're taxiing, you should have your transponder to on, especially in a situation like this, you have to do it so that they can tell where you are. So yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, in our home field, um, we have transponders to on now because of that new regulation. Yeah. Um, I'll throw a plug in there. We're putting together a ASD or ADSB session for everybody, which includes some of these uh, um, other new regulations and, and things like that. So stay tuned. <laughs> All right. So. You've managed to taxi down here, you've done your run-up, everything has gone great. You've pulled back over here to the taxi and you've called up Tower to let them know that you're ready to go. So you'd call up the Tower and say, in this case, Hanscom Tower, Cessna 12345, ready for departure 29, and then you tell them what you're doing. So it could be closed traffic, it could be departure to the west, you could tell them that you're going to a nearby airport, you could say VFR to Boston Logan or whatever. If you're going to a like far away airport, they won't know where that is, so a cardinal direction is better. But you want to tell the tower controller what you're doing because they own the airspace. So they need to know, like if you're heading off to the north and there are also 15 airplanes heading south from that side of their airspace, they need to know that so that they can, you know, deconflict some traffic, stuff like that. So you want to tell again, tell the tower 
where you are, what you want to do, where you're going. Um, there are a couple of, of options of what they can come back with. Um, the the first and simplest could just be, you know, Cessna one two three four five Hanscom Tower, hold short runway two nine. So that means that you're parked right here and you don't move. You cannot cross this hold short line. And that would be for if there's an airplane on short final, something like that. You cannot be on the runway because you can be a traffic problem. Um, the other another option you could get is line up and wait. Um, that used to be a uh, hold. Sh there used to be another uh, another word for that. Taxi into position and hold. Yeah, position and hold. <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah, they used to say position and hold. Now the words are line up and wait. So that would mean you taxi out onto the runway, you get lined up on the center line right down here, and then you don't move. Um, you could get a clearance like that because there could be a guy who just landed and he's rolling out and he's about to turn off. So this guy just landed right here and he's going to turn off down here. But if you start taking off, you could run into him because he's going slow and you're going fast. So line up and wait is literally get up into the middle of the runway, get pointed, be ready to go. Don't move. Um, and then obviously the last one would be cleared for takeoff. So when you're cleared for takeoff, you own the runway. So you can get here, you get lined up, you get set. Don't take all day because there could be other airplanes coming into land. They'll get angry at you. But you own the runway, and it is yours to take off from. Um, that's basically the, the three options that you can have for a takeoff clearance. When you're landing, um, ignoring the, like, so you, you, if you're outside the airspace, so outside of a Delta or Charlie airspace, you need permission to enter the airspace. And permission is considered to be two-way radio contact with the tower. So you'd call them up and say, you know, Hanscom Tower, because this is a Delta airport, 15 miles to the west, landing with Alpha. And so then they'll come back and say, you know, enter uh, whatever. That two-way radio communication means you're allowed in their airspace. Um, Bravo airspace is obviously different. You need specific permission to enter the Bravo. You have to hear the words cleared to enter the Bravo. Um, do not bust Bravo airspace. You get in trouble for that. So assuming that you've gotten near the airport, uh, you've been cleared to come in, um, there are obviously a, a couple of landing clearances that you can get. There's um, the option, so that's kind of anything that you want, or there's the individual things. So there's touch and goes, stop and goes, low approaches, full stops. Those are your options for what you can do. Um, and you can request any of them, or you can request the option, and then it's up to you what you want to do. Um, the uh, other couple of things that you can get is um, at a towered airport, a lot of times, if it's a really busy thing, they will say something like, I will call your base, or I will call your final, something like that. Um, it, if there's a lot of traffic stacked up ahead of you, sometimes the tower will say, I will call your base turn, and you just continue your downwind leg, and then they will say, turn left base now, and then you'll, you'll turn your base, and then you turn final, and you land. Um, that happens a lot at busier airports. Um, you can also hear something, they can say something like continue. Um, that means that your land, so they'll say landing clearance canceled, continue. Um, that's a really interesting one. And, and that one uh, can be really confusing because what that means is continue what you're doing. So don't maintain your altitude, continue your approach. Uh, there's somebody ahead of you who is going to land or who has to get off the runway and they can't have too many clearances at once, but they will tell you very shortly um, when you get a continued clearance, they know what you're doing, you should keep doing it and you will get a landing clearance soon. That one's not super common, but if you hear it, it's good to know what you're supposed to do there. Um, and then the only other thing that's really important to know about is land and hold short operations. Um, you will find out if there's a uh, lasso operation well in advance because it'll be in the ATIS broadcast. They will tell you that they're doing it and then the tower controller will tell you that they want you to do that. Um, you do not have to accept a lasso clearance and student pilots are not allowed to accept them. So that's important to remember. Um, and what that means is they could be landing. So for example, they could be landing on 2-9 and taking off from 2-3 simultaneously. And if they tell you, you know, you know, clear to land runway 29 and land and hold short operations are in effect, you need to stop before this. So this is that runway hold bar, but it's on a runway, not on a taxiway. That would be why. Um, lasso operations are 
more common at really big airports, but do not feel pressure to take one if you don't want to. It's fine. Um, you should feel comfortable about it because what it means is you are going to have a shorter distance to land in than normal. So you need to fully understand and accept that and you don't have to if you don't want to. That's really important to remember. Um, but if you do decide to accept it, make sure that you have stopped before that hold short bar or you can cause traffic problems and that's bad. So the, the only thing I'll add on to that when, whenever we're talking about landing clearances is it's it's very important to understand the difference between cleared touch and go, cleared for the option, and cleared to land, right? Yeah. So if you're cleared for the touch and go, obviously you can come down, touch the pavement, and start going again. If you're cleared for the option, which a lot of controllers will give you um, anyways just to make sure you have that option. You can do whatever you want. You can do a touch and go. You can do a stop and go. You can do a full stop. It's completely up to you. You have the option. If you're cleared to land, you have to land the aircraft and you have to get off the taxiway. It's very important that you understand that distinction. If you're cleared to land, uh, you can't do a touch and go. That's yeah. very bad. Yeah. However, I will tell you if you're if you're cleared to land. And if there's anything wrong with your approach or you don't think that you can land the aircraft for any reason, do a go around. A go around will trump everything, right? Yeah. So if you're coming into land, you're having a problem, you're off the center line, whatever, do a go around, tell the tower, Cessna 12345, going around. They're going to be cranky because you just messed up their traffic pattern, but that is your right. However, yeah. if you're clear to land, you must land the airplane, right? Yeah, and, absolutely. And you, go, and you go for the landing. You have to stop. So yes. that's an important distinction. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then once you've landed, um, they will oftentimes say turn off at either a specific taxiway or turn off at the next taxiway. Um, you should aim for that to do your best. But, you know, it, like if if let's say you land on 2-9 and they want you to get off on this first taxiway and it's just not going to happen, don't like slam on your brakes and flat spot the tires. Just say unable and, and that's fine and you will continue down and maybe they'll have you turn down the runway, something like that. That's totally okay. Um, but regardless, when you get to a taxiway, you, you've slowed down, you're at a controllable speed, you turn off. Um, so remember these hold short bars, you're allowed to cross the dashed side without clearance. And that's what you are required to do. So it's obvious, you know, you're on the runway and you want to get off the runway. But the important thing is continue until the entire airplane is past this bar. So your tail has to get past this bar. And then when you're parked here, stop. And that's when the tower will tell you contact ground. Um, they may even tell you, you know, as part of your clearance, like, you know, uh, clear at the next taxiway and contact ground point seven. So what that means is you're going to taxi off. You're going to get past the hold short bar with the entire airplane. It's not just like the nose and your seat. It's the entire airplane. Pass this hold short bar, stop the airplane, then contact ground control, and they will give you a taxi clearance back to the ramp. So, you know, you would say something like handsome ground, Cessna 12345, clear runway 29 at Gulf or wherever you are, taxi to the west ramp and then they'll come back with the taxi clearance you'll taxi back to the ramp um you know again as you taxi back to the ramp the final thing is you'll come back to this movement non-movement area line and again you can cross the dash side without any clearance so you'll taxi down here you'll cross this now that you're back in the non-movement area you can do whatever you want so you can you know park the airplane here and then you realize oh crap i actually have to be down here so you can just taxi around you don't have to talk to anybody because you're in the non-movement area so once you're once you're in here you're safe you can do whatever you want um, if you cause a lot of trouble airport ops will probably come out and yell at you in their truck but atc no longer cares what you're doing when you're in in the non-movement area so that's that's basically it um for for towered airport operations uh you know again radio calls who you are what you want where you're going things like that every single radio call is formatted the same so I think that's about it. Um, I've got lots more on radio work, but we're probably out of time. 
Yeah, we're we're a little bit over, but I I think it was, I think it was worth trying to get through this. So, um, radio work will kind of uh, we'll kind of hand off to. Uh, we're trying to put together an ATC uh, session. It's not on the schedule right now, but I think we can hand it off there. So, yep. really awesome session. I know that. Um, Airport operations is very important for everybody. So thank you very much for managing the session. It was yeah, an absolutely. awesome session, right? Um, so while we're waiting for mm -hmm. any final questions that might come in, I know that there's a little bit delay. I'll tell you what's coming up here. So first of all, I'll say that both the website and our Google Plus is a little bit out of date. We're still trying to work through some of our technical issues. Um, coming up this Sunday, October 2nd is our airspace. So Mark was talking, kind of rushed through the Bravo and the Charlie and things like that. No worries. Uh, this Sunday, we're going to be talking about airspace. Um, the following Tuesday after that is all about the aeronautical charts. So again, Mark skipped over a lot of what's on the aeronautical chart. So we'll be covering that. So those are the two sessions that are coming up. Um, looking for any final questions and I don't see any. Okay. Um, so great, Mark, thank you so much. I really appreciate you leading the session. Yeah. And if there's no other questions and I'm delaying here just a couple seconds to make sure, um, there's nothing else. And with that, we'll go ahead and close it out and I'll see everybody on Sunday. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.